Hello and welcome back. In this episode we're going to create a new console application. We're going to register that console application within Identity Server and we're then going to use that console application to obtain an access token and then use that access token to send an authenticated request to our API project. So the first thing that we are going to want to do is right click our Identity Server solution, click on Add New Project you're going to want to select console application and I'm going to simply call it console application like so, leaving everything else as default. If I then hit create, that will give us a new console application project that you can see here on the left hand side. Now this only has a single program class with a main method inside it and this is what essentially runs our console application. You'll notice in the top right that we have a list of configurations here and we have at the bottom a new console application run configuration. If we run that console application you can see that we have hello world output to the console and that's thanks to this console.writeline hello world. So now that we've verified that we have our console application up and running and working successfully we can now set it up to call the discovery document that I showed you earlier and use the token endpoint to get an access token. So first things first, right click on console application and click on manage NuGet packages and we're going to want to install the identity model NuGet package. That's this one just here at the top and this will help us out with our OpenID Connect and all two flows. So install that package into our console application, close that down and what we can then do is we can say using var discovery document http client equals new http client like so. We can say var discovery document equals await discovery document http client dot get discovery document async and we can give it the address of our identity server which is localhost port 5001. You'll notice we have uh, some rare squiggles there on the await. That's because our main method is currently synchronous. So if we click on await, click on the red light bulb, and we can make method main async task. And you can see it's now an asynchronous method rather than a synchronous method. What we can do to verify that this is working successfully, we can say console.writeline discovery document dot token endpoint and if we make sure that our identity server is running like so give that a few moments just to build and we now have our identity server spun up and running in the background so if we come down to our console application and if we now run that console application like so you can see that we have that token endpoint localhost port 5001 slash connect slash token so next up, now that we've linked our console application with the identity server's discovery document, we can come into identity server and register a new client for this console application. So if we minimize that for now, come into the startup of our identity server and you'll notice we currently have an empty list of clients. What we're going to want to do is create a brand new client, like so. Now I'm going to give this a client ID of console because this is a console application. In your application, you may wish to use a GUID, for example, as a unique identifier, but it's important that this client ID should be unique amongst all of your clients. So I'm going to give it a client ID, as I say, of console. I'm then going to give it a new client secret. Now, this is a, a list of secrets. So if you wanted to, you could have more than one secret for a client application. However, I am just going to create a single uh, secret. So I'm going to say new secret, and I'm just going to give it a value of secret, and then I'm going to hash it using SHA-256. You'll notice that we also have options to provide a description for this client secret, and also an expiration date time for the secret. So if you only wanted the secret to be valid for a year, for example, then you can explicitly set an expiration date here 
when you're creating the secret. However, I'll leave this as null, which means the secret will be valid indefinitely. Now that we've created our client ID and a client secret, I'm then going to come down to here and I'm going to specify the allowed grant types. Now the grant types are essentially the authentication flows that the client application is allowed to use to ultimately request an access token. Now those flows include the authorization code flow and the client credentials code flow. Because this is a non-interactive console application, i.e. it's not running with any sort of interactive end user, it's just running in the background in its own process, we're going to use the client credentials flow because that is a non-interactive flow intended for machine-to-machine -machine communication. So we can say grant types dot client credentials like so, and that will register our application to use the client credentials grant type. Last but not least, we have our list of allowed scopes. And this is a list of strings. And you'll recall previously, we've created an API scope. And so in the list of allowed scopes for our client, we're going to say API. And this means that the console application is allowed to get an access token with the API scope to then use against the API project. Again, as previously mentioned, if you have multiple scopes, for example, read and write, you can specify which scopes you want the client to be allowed to request using this allowed scopes list, like so. Now that this is set up here in our identity server, we can come back into our console applications program class. And underneath here, we can say var token response equals await discovery document HTTP client request client credentials token async, and this will be passed in a new client credentials token request object. Now this contains, uh, first of all, an address. So what we can do is we can say address equals discovery document dot token endpoint. That is the token endpoint that we can use to obtain an access token from identity server. We can then say client ID equals console Again, this is the exact client ID that we created in our identity server startup. These values should both match. So if you've given your uh, client a different client ID, then make sure that both of these values match like so. Next up, we can specify client secret of just secret. Once again, this client secret should match exactly with the value that you provided here in the identity server startup. And of course it goes without saying, when you're doing this in a non-local environment, especially in production, you want to create a much more secure secret than just secret. Next up, last but not least, we can specify our scope, and that is API. Now you'll notice that the scope parameter here is a string, and this is a space separated list of requested scopes. So whereas in identity server, the list of allowed scopes is a list of strings, inside our client credentials token request, it's a space separated string with all of the scopes. So for example, if you wanted to request the read and write scopes, you would say read space write. And then you would register both of those as read and write here as two separate scopes in the list, like so. So in identity server, it's a list of strings and in our client credentials token request, it's a single string with space separated values. So what we can do is set that back to just API. And in our program, we can set that back to just API like so. And what we can then do is console.writeLine token response dot access token. What I'm going to do, because we updated our identity server configuration in memory here, I'm going to restart the identity server application. So I'm going to stop and rerun it. So it has this updated configuration inside of it. That's now running like so. And if I now come into our console application and run that, give it a few moments to build. And you'll notice we have our token endpoint like so. And we also now have an access token. If I copy that access token like so, come back into the browser, and I've got jwt.io here open. 
and this allows us to uh, decode access tokens to view their payload data. So we can paste that access token encoded on the left hand side and you'll notice over on the right we have a list of claims. So you can see here we have an issuer of localhost 5001, that's the URL that our identity server is running at. We then have a not before time and this is the seconds since the Unix epoch and essentially this means that the token is not valid for use before this particular time. We can see when the token was issued at, these will typically be the same time as the not before, i.e. you can't use a token before it was issued, naturally. You then have the expiration time in seconds since the Unix epoch and this is the time that the access token will expire. So after that time, the access token will no longer be valid for use. You can then see we have a list of scopes here. So we have a scope here called API, and that matches the API scope that we requested in our client credentials token request. Last but not least, we have the client ID of console, and that client ID again matches the client ID in our client credentials token request and the client ID that we assigned in our identity server. So we now have an access token that we can use to send an authenticated request into our API. So what I'm going to do is minimize that and we can then say using var API HTTP client equals new HTTP client like so and we can say API HTTP client dot set bearer token and we can then provide our access token here inside this method call. Now what we're going to want to do because we've just got our token response nested inside this using statement we're going to want to move that up outside of the using statement. So by clicking on the refactoring there we can split variable declaration and initialization and move it to the outer scope. So that's super handy because that's now allowed us to move the token response outside of the using statement but still keep the code inside the using statement the same. So what we can then do is say token response dot access token like so and that will update the bearer token of this HTTP client to the access token that we get back from identity server. So now what we can do is we can say var response equals await api http client dot get string async like so and the request you will write is going to be https localhost port 5003 remember that's the port that we set the api to run on and we can then say console dot write line response like so. Now if we spin up our API because we need that running in order to send a request into it, so give that a few moments to build and run our API, we can now see that we have our API running here in the background and if we come back here, come into our console application and if we now run our console application like so, we can see that the response status code does not indicate success. 404 not found and that's because we just need to add the weather forecast endpoint onto our URL. So we can come into our controller, weather forecast controller and we can simply copy weather forecast which is the name of the controller, come back into our console application and pop that on the end like so. If we now run this again it will go off and get an access token and you can see here response status code does not indicate success 401 unauthorized. Now you might be wondering, well we've got an access token, we've checked that it's got the API scope and it's perfectly valid, so why is the API coming back with a 401 unauthorized? Well that's because by default an API will look to validate the audience claim that's inside an access token. If we come into our JWT.io you'll notice that we don't have an audience claim in our list of claims within the payload data. And that means that the API 
is unable to validate the audience and so it's rejecting the access token. So what we can do is come into our API project and inside our startup if we come down to our add JWT bearer and if we expand that out underneath options.authority we can say options dot token validation parameters equals new token validation parameters and we can say validate audience equals false. Now this is true by default because it will always look to validate the audience to make sure that the access token is intended to be used for this API. However, because we haven't actually registered the API with an identity server, we don't get an audience claim emitted into the access token. It's, it's not there. So by setting this validate audience to false, we're basically telling the API not to look for that audience claim and not to validate it. So if we now rerun our API project because we made that change in the startup class, open that back up again, and if we now pop back into our console application, like so, and if we now rerun that console application, you can see that we have a list of weather forecasts successfully from our API, like so. So in this episode, I've shown you how to create a new console application here. We've then, inside the identity server, added the console application as a client. We've given it a client ID of console, a client secret of secret. We specified the allowed grant type to client credentials because this is a non-interactive machine-to-machine application. And we've then specified the allowed scopes to include the API scope so that this console application is allowed to request the API scope. Inside our console application, we've then fetched the discovery document. We've used the token endpoint from that discovery document here to get a new uh, token response from our client credentials token request, specifying the client ID of console, client secret of secret, and the scope of API. We've then newed up another HTTP client. We've set the bearer token to the access token that we get back from the token response. And we've then used that authenticated API HTTP client to send an authenticated request to the weather forecast endpoint. And we've then got a list of weather forecasts back as a string from that endpoint. So I hope you found this episode useful. Thank you very much for watching. And I'll see you next time.